Welcome back to P Hope, where the P stands for she done put the baby down and picked the bottle up. Law, have mercy. What's up, y'all? It's your girl P Hope, and this is another review of Love After Lockup Season 3. This is episode 10, I believe. Y'all know, like the last two Love After Lockup reviews I did, I didn't know the episode, but I think I got it right this time. This is season three, episode 10, but this is still the cast from season two. So we should have like um two or three more weeks of the season two cast because um our regular season three cast will come back on Friday, October the 9th. So we'll be ready to pick back up uh, on all they crazy asses. But anyway, so this particular episode, I'm going to start out with Tony and Angela. Let's see, honey. Uh, Angela is still sitting up here holding this damn bat in her hand. And she cannot believe that Tony has showed his ass up at her house. So she's yelling. She's asking him what the hell does she want? What is What the hell does he want? Because y'all remember he came with that carton of cigarettes. And she said she didn't want that shit. But y'all, she not... I would love to know how much money she spends in a month just on cigarettes alone because like literally when you put one cigarette out, I mean, I know that there's a such thing as chain smokers, but I've just never seen it in person or, you know, like I've never physically seen nobody do it until I met Angela. Like she literally will put one cigarette out and fire up. She's ready for the next one. She's immediately ready for the next one. And I'm just like, Lord, like, it's just too much. It's Y'all know them cigarettes do something to me. So, anyway, he's standing out in the yard and he's pleading his case. He on some baby, please, baby, baby, please. And so, she tells him how he has got a lot of nerves showing up at her house to talk to her. He says that it's because he is ready to change. He is a changed man. And, you know, just give him a minute. And she said, well, you lucky I'm even letting your ass sit right there. Like, you know, because they went and sat on the little bench in the yard. She was on one side of the table with that cigarette and he was on the other. And so, you know, she's like, look, go, go ahead and say whatever you got to say because we ain't going to no damn house. She calls bullshit and she says that, you know, you talk, you showed up here talking about you ready to change. Well, if you wanted to change, then you'll change. Like period and y'all i can't i cannot do my angela impression tonight because i ain't had enough water to be oh lord with all them cigarettes in her throat i i can't i just can't do it but y'all she was hot she was yelling at the top of her lungs and so um let's see he wants angela to counsel him as his personal therapist she said that she cannot do that now five days a week but she did give him a small session she started asking him questions like what does he want out of life and how can he change and work on himself you know and so he's sitting here giving these damn mediocre ass nursery school ass answers like you know uh you know i can change and i feel like i'm ready to change because the vows that we took on our wedding day like you know at that time i wasn't ready but now i'm ready and then he turns around and say, um, is that a good answer? Is, you know, is that good enough? And me and Angela was sitting there looking like, well, bitch, is it? I don't know. Is it good enough? Like, you tell me. And so Tony is just, I felt like he was saying whatever he needed to say to get on the other side of that door. So I don't know if he is tired of sleeping at the motel or if he has lost his job or, you know, I don't really know what's going on with Tony right now, but just nothing about that conversation seemed genuine. And I think that Angela felt that same way. I felt like she could really see through his bullshit. So even though she loves him and, you know, she would love for everything that was coming out of his mouth to be true. I just don't think that she fell for it. You know what I'm saying? And, um... But, 
very well. You shouldn't fall for it. You go, Angela. But I'm kind of like still with Faye at the same time. I do believe uh, Miss C-19 had a lot to do with the fact that she has not taken him back before now because she really is taking this social distancing thing um serious because we saw that last week when she social distanced herself with her sister and she ain't playing with tony either you know what i'm saying as hard up as she might be for some pain and as much as she loved tony he gonna have to go you know what i'm saying love should have bought your ass home last night love should have bought your ass home four months ago because at this point miss rona is in town and i don't have time for it you know what i'm saying you gonna have to go back to the motel back to the prostitutes back to wherever it is that you came from because i ain't got it on me right now like period angela lets him know that she never filed their marriage certificate so they're not legally married uh tony says you know at the end of the day that's a small thing to a giant. He's not worried about that. He just wants her back. Angela tells us that Tony is not the only inmate that she's ever dealt with. She said before Tony, um, you know, somebody else had her heart. And it was a man named Ross. She says that um, her and Ross had a wonderful pen pal type of relationship. And that she would do things like send him his horoscope every morning so that he would, you know, know how his day is going to go. And um, they would communicate. And he always told her good morning each and every morning. And they had got to a point where they had this argument and they kind of fell out with each other and they stopped communicating. And but now he is a free man. But. And then she started crying, y'all. She said, you know, I guess you could say that, yeah, I do love Ross. And she was crying, but then she also said that even though now Ross is a free man, she's not sure if he can actually give her what she needs. So, you know, we'll see what's going to transpire between Angela and Ross, honey, because she says she loves Ross. She got a pitter patter in her heart for Ross. But at the same time, she admitted that she still loves Tony as well. So who knows what the hell Angela going to do. We just have to, you know, stay tuned. You know how that go. Shane and Lacey, y'all. Let's see. Shane has been back in the house ever since they met up at the boardwalk that day. And he says that he has been really happy and things have been going really good between him and Lacey. He also let us know that he has been honoring his probation and that he has paid off all his court fees. They got the kids outside jumping on the trampoline because y'all know Lacey kids, they're a little older. So, um, you know, they probably get real hype and they probably do a whole bunch when them cameras there because they already naturally hyper kids. So then, you know, you have a camera crew there in your face. I'm thinking it's still some type of camera crew there, even though um, it's the during the pandemic. I don't think you know they're letting they're letting them film themselves it's got to be at least one cameraman in there i'm pretty sure and so you know when you got all these extra people around you it's like the kids is like shit i'm gonna take this opportunity and milk it i'm gonna turn up and so they got the kids outside on the trampoline so he gives lacy a kiss and he like look i'm gonna go out here and monitor these kids before uh they break these people shit out here because it looked like they had a camera strapped somewhere around the uh trampoline and one of the kids was getting mighty close like hmm i wonder if if i kick this camera off the trampoline what happened to me when he goes outside to um to go be with the kids she took that opportunity to go to her bedroom and call i'm assuming this was just her home girl y'all if this was a relative like a sister or auntie or cousin or something y'all have to drop down in the comment section and let me know because i'm gonna call that her home girl for right now that's her friend so um let's see she goes into the bedroom to tell the friend she pretty much just wants to update her friend on everything that's going on in the relationship so she tells her that um homeschooling with the kids has been a nightmare um you know she said that it's pretty much racking her nerves because the kids want her to do their work and she like that because the kids are telling her that they don't understand it and she like well shit i don't understand it either and i was too 
tickled when she said that because I I be the same way. Like all my friends know, Mondays I think it's Monday and Thursday. Don't look for me to do no exercise. I'm not working out with y'all after work. I'm not finna kiki on the phone with you because Mondays and Thursdays for my daughter is her math. And when I tell y'all I be stressed out and she just in elementary school and I be sitting there looking at that damn Chromebook like, okay, so the one okay and then that's a seven so then you carry carry that y'all i be stressed i be straight up stressed out so um i definitely was tickled at lacy when she said that but um yeah so she said she been homeschooling the kids and then you know when they're not doing their homeschool they just running around and they super busy or whatever but on top of all of that her and Shane are still going through with the IVF, IVF process of trying to have a baby. And so, you know, her friend was looking like, okay, so you're not going to try to just do it naturally? And she said, no, she doesn't want to do that because um, that would require her having to have her tubes reversed. Because she already has her tubes tied. So um, they would have to do the reversal surgery. And I think um, that was that was last season when they went to visit the doctor. And the doctor had told her that, you know, um, reversal surgery was very dangerous. And so um, Shane didn't want her to go through that. So, but the friends thing is. Are you doing this because you need another baby or want another baby? Or are you doing this just because Shane doesn't have any children? And she said that she admitted that she was very hesitant. And that a lot of the reason is because Shane does not have any kids of his own. And she feels like she would like to give him that. So, you know, that's, that's kind of like, I get it. But at the same time, I understand where the friend was coming from too. Because her thing was, okay, so what happens when something else comes along, another hurdle in the relationship, and Shane can possibly be up and out? Now you're left with a what, third or fourth child, I think that will probably be the fourth child, that she will be there with by herself. You know what I'm saying? You already pulling your hair out with the kids that you got. So what happens if you're left with another child by yourself? And, you know, Lacey just doesn't really want to think about that. And, and she just wants to, you know, do what she can to get this process moving along. But, you know, I feel like it did kind of, reality did kind of hit her over the head when the friend said that. And she probably is going to take that into consideration. So we'll see at some point if they show Lacey have a conversation with Shane about really wanting to have a baby. But um, overall, she feels like Shane is going to be a good father to his, um, to his own child. And she does want to honor that and, and give him a baby. Andrea and Lamar. All right, what we got? Let's see. Lamar is spending the day with Tennyson. And so one of the first things that they do is he wants to take Tennyson to meet his brother. Um, Lamar's brother's name is Dulo. So, all right. They get over Dulo's house. And Dulo is definitely happy to see the both of them. And he is explaining to Tennyson how he should feel a little more comfortable especially around this time because the crime rate in la has reduced by 70 percent tennyson is not very convinced uh you know about being so comfortable because dulo was just recently shot in the foot so he's like okay you're telling me that i should be comfortable but just a couple of weeks or months ago, you yourself were shot in the foot. So just how comfortable am I supposed to be? And like, you know, how do you know if you're in a safe or unsafe neighborhood? 
So they kind of make a joking moment about that. And, you know, Lamar and Dulo are saying like, look, if you are in a neighborhood where you see people jogging and walking their dog and looking carefree, you know you in a good neighborhood. But other than that, if you don't see that, then just know that some shit could pop off at any minute. And so um, all three of them just had, you know, kind of like a little kiki about that. And let's see. So, um, then Dulo goes into telling Tennyson how, um, if that was just a freak accident. And, you know, that you just have to be careful of your surroundings was pretty much how that conversation went. You know, Dulo fires up a blunt and tells Tennyson, you know, hey, bro, you know what I'm saying? You 18 now. So, you know what I'm saying? You ready to go on ahead and hit the good stuff. And Tennyson immediately is looking at him like, sir, like, no, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm good on that. I'm straight on that. Like, so, and then I think he went into confessionals and he was like, you know, I'm really uncomfortable about it. He was like, so, um, you know, if they feel like they have to fire up marijuana around me, then next time I'm just going to get up and leave the room because, you know, it's, it's against, I'm uncomfortable being around it first of all, but then second of all, it's kind of against my religion and what I'm standing for because y'all know that, you know, he is going off into the mission or whatever. So, um, but you know. Dulo wasn't trying to pressure it on Tennyson, but he was offering it to him, you know, like, come on, man, you know, it's whatever. But our good friend Lamar did step in and he was, you know, he told Dulo, like, hey, bro, like, chill with all that. Like, that's not cool for you to offer that to my stepson. You know what I'm saying? Like, he ain't about that. He not comfortable with that. But he just pretty much let Dulo know, like, what we do is what we do, but we're not going to do that around my kids. We're not going to do that around my kids or my stepkids, like whatever you want to call them. Like, we're not going to do this. And Dulo, um, he respected that. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't never a situation where he was trying to put pressure on the issue. But um, in the confessional, Tennyson did let us know that this whole little scenario that has happened, he will have to run this by his mother. And, um, you know, people were definitely pressed about the fact that Tennyson is going to let Andrea know. I guess I'm the only one at this point that completely agrees with Tennyson that he should get ahead of it and he should tell her. Like, um, Andrea strikes me as the type of person that will watch these episodes. I feel like they watch the show just like we watch the show. So when she looks back on this and sees that Tennyson was in that scenario, she will have even more, I'm not going to say distrust, but you know, it's just unadded pressure on Tennyson if she, if he don't say nothing, if he don't say nothing, then that's going to put him in a position where Andrea is looking at him like, okay, so all of this happened when you went to meet Dulo and you didn't want to tell me that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what are, like, can I trust you to do anything now? Y'all already know that that's how Andrea is. So I, I'm with you, Tennyson. I promise you, if, if nobody is on your side, I'm on your side. That you should have definitely told your mama at the time that it happened because that is saving your ass. And at the end of the day, you got to protect your ass. Your, uh, your, your, your stepdaddy, he is a grown ass man and he can get himself out of that situation with Andrea. And, you know, but I'm taking up for you too, Lamar, because I feel like... Um, you handled that situation as, as well as you could have as well. You know what I'm saying? You weren't disrespectful to your brother. Your brother wasn't disrespectful to you. It was just a situation where he did, your brother did some shit that was inappropriate. It was handled at that time and it's done. So then they go to this other scene 
where Nyla and Andrea are standing in the middle of, it looks like a Walgreens or a CVS, and they on the medicine aisle, honey, and we know how loud and country Andrea is. So she want to sit there and talk to Nyla about the birds and the bees. She got a pregnancy test in her hand. It looked like they're over there with the um with the pads and tampons and stuff and then you got medicine on this side of the uh aisle and nyla is looking around like mom like we're not the only people in this store like just chill like it's okay we don't have to have this birds and bees conversation right here right now but of course in true andrea fashion she just keeps talking and so nyla at this point is just ready to get the hell up out the damn store when they get back home, Nala, of course, has to feel Tennyson in on this embarrassing moment. And Tennyson is just trying to figure out for the life of him why his mama is so extra. So Nala's like, yeah, so, you know, that's how my day went. So how was yours? And so then he tells Nala about the experience over his Uncle Dulo's house. And about how he was offered, you know, some weed or whatever. And Nala is like child you know that mama is about to flip her shit when she find out but you know you need to tell her you know nyla agreed because they know they mama y'all these kids know they mama and y'all know that these are some very mature kids so they would know the best way to deal with andrea I'm sure it's certain stuff that they have done or been exposed to that Andrea probably don't know about. But in this situation, this is a situation where they need to get ahead of the game. So we'll figure out next week how the hell um, Andrea ass is going to react to this news that Tennyson is going to drop on her. Brittany and Marcelino. All right, so when we get to Brittany and Marcelino's house, they are doing some um, construction work in their backyard. Um, let's see. Baby Marciano is swinging in his baby swing. Zoila is running all over the house like Jack-Jack from The Incredibles. I'm talking about she just here, there, and everywhere. And you can hear Brittany telling her, come up out the kitchen, the stove on, your ass gonna get burnt. Like, you know, it's a lot going on. Gio, he was up doing the goddamn Harlem Shake for a second. And then you show, they showed a clip of him again. He was eating up all the damn snacks. Then you got a couple of dogs running around the house, knocking shit down off the tables and carrying on. And it was just a bunch of chaos in the house. So the bottom line is that the house is just way too small for all those people and all those animals and Brittany is over it. Okay. Brittany says that she is frustrated and that Marcelino, um, she did ask Marcelino to um, renovate the backyard. And um, she was under the impression that the total was around $10,000. Well, you know, Marcelino was like $10,000. And she said, yeah, you know, um, when you had went and got the quote, the man told you between nine and $10,000. And he was like, oh, well, yeah, well, that was for the cheapy, cheapy stuff. Like, you know, by the time they got everything that we kind of need in the backyard, I think it came up to a little bit over or like right at 25000 and so she was looking like, what the hell? Like, how do you go out and spend an extra $15,000 from our account and you didn't want to run that by me? And she was like, you know, when was I going to know that? Or how would I have known that? And he was like, you know, <laughs> hell, look out, the, <laughs> look out the back door. Take a PC out there. And you, can, you should be able to tell that that costs more than $10,000. And... That's the type of attitude that Marcelino has kind of had the whole time. And that is the shit that aggravates the absolute dog shit out of Brittany. She cannot understand why Marcelino does not look at stuff like that as a lie. And I get exactly where she's coming from when she says that. Now, did Marcelino lie to you? No, Marcelino, you didn't lie. But when you disclose stuff from your partner, 
It's like she said, you're still out here moving around like you're single. When you are a married man, your left hand always know what your right hand is doing. You know what I'm saying? But see, you so used to that gambling life and that bachelor life that that's where your mentality still is. Is that is you never let your left hand know what the right hand is doing. But in a marriage, you can't do that. So even though you might not consider that as, as something major in your head, you probably considering it as, okay, I got everything that my wife wanted. So she's going to be happy. Well, no, because if she feels like it's something that she's being left out of on this process, then no, I'm not happy. So just learn to communicate a little better and you need to start moving like a like one unit you can't keep moving like you're separate like you're single you have to move as one unit you know what i'm saying Brittany needs to know what you got going on and you need to know what Brittany got going on so that nobody is left in the dark about nothing that's point blank period between her being so frustrated she says that she wants to call her mom over to babysit so that her, her and Marcelino can go out on a much deserving date, okay? She says she just wants to get out the house, get some fresh air. She is tired of looking at them four walls and, you know, all them children and all them animals. Like, just let me out for a little while. Um, she said that Marcelino and her mom had a conversation. And Marcelino basically told Brittany's mom, like, look. I understand that, you know, you want to be back in Brittany's life, but we are a family now. You know, we have these children and we don't want your grandchildren to be susceptible to the same things that Brittany grew up around. So at the end of the day, you need to pick, you need to pick your family or you need to pick alcohol, but you can't have both. And so, you know, of course, Brittany's mom picked family she wants Brittany and she definitely wants her grandkids you know what I'm saying she wants to be there and she wants to do right so yeah so they call her over to babysit so that they can go out um the mom gets there she's loving all over the kids she got her mask on and I think she ended up taking it off um before um uh, Brittany and Marcelino left or whatever but Brittany had already said that her mama hadn't been going nowhere. She just been chilling at home. So, you know, they felt very safe about her coming over to babysit. So, um, so then Brittany and Marcelino take off on their date and <laughs> they are both very skeptical and very scared. And that's how I was when I went out for the first time, even though I'm an essential worker. So I never stopped coming out the house. I always had to go to work. But like the first time that I had went inside of a restaurant to get a to-go order, um, my first time being in the grocery store during the pandemic and all of that all kind of stuff, like y'all, I was weirded out for real. So I definitely understand how they feel. <clears throat> now, whatever area that they were in, when they pulled up, when I tell you it looked like ghost town, so I don't know what area that they were in, but there was absolutely nobody out there but them. I think um, Marcelino had his mask kind of like hanging around his neck, and I didn't see Brittany with a mask at all, which, um, honey, if you was out there and you didn't have no mask on you, shame, shame on you. You know, they get out the car and they're walking around and they are strolling up to, I guess they're going to like a bar or whatever, because all Brittany wanted to do um, for their little date was go out and have a drink. She told her mama that she was gonna go out and have her a Long Island. And um, so all pretty much it showed was them um, walking into this place and sitting down at the bar. So I guess that's literally what they did. They probably just had a drink and came on back home. So then it cuts to a scene where they did make it back home. And so when they come through the door, I think Brittany was the first person to come in. And um, the sister is um, sitting there on the sofa holding little baby Marcy. Uh, what's her name? Marciano? holding the, the newborn and so Brittany looking crazy like what you doing here and so 
the sister was like, yeah, so, you know, mom called me over to chill for a little while. You know, she let me know she was babysitting or whatever. So I came over here to sit with her. And the next thing I know, she done left. You know, she got me here stuck with these kids. And so Brittany is like, what? And she was like, yeah. And, you know, not only has she left me with these kids, but, um, you know, I think she's kind of falling off the wagon a little bit. And then just as sure as she said that, she said she had a phone notification that went off. And she said that her debit card was missing. And now it's sending her notifications that her bank account, it has less than $50 in it. I said, Lord, have mercy. But, you know, they already know what they're dealing with. You know, their mom has an alcohol addiction. So, I don't know how much money the sister had in the bank prior to that notification. But, it sounds like it must have been a pretty significant amount of money in there. And now, it's under $50. And, I'm saying that because I think it was Brittany that made a comment and said something about... Well, you know, if it's saying that now your bank account is under $50, like that's more than just a drink. So I don't know if her mom is into drugs and alcohol or if her alcohol addiction is just that bad to where she can just really go. Um, Brittany said that she's frustrated because um, since the pandemic, her mother has not been able to physically go to her AA classes which is very unfortunate, but they were still offering virtual AA classes, but her mom refused to take them. Um, so she told her sister to give the baby to Marciana, uh, to what her name? <laughs> Y'all, yeah, Marcelino, Brittany, <laughs> Brittany told her sister to get a baby to Marcelino because they about to get in the car and ride. They about to go find this lady and you know, it's some going to be some words exchanged. And then the sister was pretty much saying, well, you know, we already know when you mix you and mom together, like it's always a fight. So this is nothing new. So that's where they stopped that at. So we will find out what's about to go down between Brittany and her mama next week. I think they will probably be, you know, the highlight of the show because Brittany is fired up right now. She just about as fired up as her damn hair and she is ready to give her mama a piece of her damn mind. So, yeah. And last but not least, y'all, Michael and Sarah. I got Michael, Sarah, and Maria up here because, you know, it's kind of like a package deal. But, um, this week, that was it was pretty much just about Michael and Sarah. So, um, Sarah goes to the gym and she's she meets up with the best friend. Y'all remember the best friend from season two because a lot of people thought that the best friend was crushing on Sarah. Now, I will admit, there was a couple of scenes where I felt like, you know... She could have had like a little crush on Sarah or whatever. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think she is just one of those friends that really just wants to see the best for her homegirl. And, you know, it just frustrates her when Sarah doesn't get it. So anyway, they done met up at the gym because the best friend body is already, you know, fit and toned and snatched to the guys. So... Sarah wants to get away from her mommy body and she wants to get snatched as well. So while they're working out, she wants to um, tell her friend about how if Michael does not show up at Baby Rain's first birthday party, then it is over. <laughs> and the best friend said, well, man, I really hope he doesn't show up then. Because when I tell y'all, we know how the best friend cannot stand Michael. This lady can't stand Michael. So, you know, she just made it known. She ain't try to sugarcoat it. She said, well, I hope that food don't show up then. And, um, let's see. But she also, but Sarah also let the best friend know that, but I done invited Malcolm. Now, the best friend thinks that Malcolm is just 
the perfect man for Sarah because she goes into talking about how sweet Michael is and how um, he always tells, I mean, I said Michael, Malcolm. She's talking about how sweet Malcolm is and um, how Malcolm always tells Sarah how beautiful she is. He holds the door open for her. And at the end of the day, he's just everything that Michael is not. So, you know, she is definitely team Malcolm all the way. And let's see. Oh, so then Sarah starts telling the best friend of how she wants to call Michael and get in touch with him so that Michael and Malcolm can meet each other before the party so that it won't be no drama on the day of and so baby Rain's birthday can just you know run as smooth as possible which I think is a really good idea because even though you know I said last week I feel like it was messy of how Sarah invited Malcolm and then told him that Michael will be there. I feel like the way that she went about it was very petty and very messy. But, you know, since you done already made that mess, a good way for you to clean it up is this idea that you have this week, which is, you know, letting the two men meet each other before the party so that it won't become a, a, a shit show. You know what I'm saying? <sighs> So then it goes to a scene where you have Michael stopping by the mom's house and he just stopped by to visit and ha now is that me or have we ever been inside of Michael's mom's house? It seems like every time they film at her house, it's either in the driveway or on the porch because this time we on the porch too. So drop down in the comment section if y'all ever remember uh, um, any episodes where we went in her house because she doesn't strike me as the type of woman that would keep a nasty house so maybe like maybe she's that type of woman that's got a lot of people in her house I don't know that just that just hit me that we've never I don't remember ever seeing inside of this lady house but anyway so Michael pulls up and he pops a squat on the porch. So they both sitting out there on the porch and the mama's like, you know, so what's up? What you, you know what I'm saying? What you stopping by here got going on? Cause honey, somebody finally done, you know, whipped her hair up. I guess, you know, she knew production was coming. So she told Kiki down the street that, you know what I'm saying? Whip her up something. Kiki had the wrong color hair, but she was like, look, it's last minute. We're just going to go on and put this in and make you look like a pretty, pretty princess. So she gave Mama, uh, Mama Michael this uh, long one curl ponytail and then uh, this brown ass bang with her black real hair. So yeah, that's what the hell was going on sitting out there on the porch. But anyway, I'm not going to let that distract me. Um... Uh, Michael asked where Day Day was. She said that uh, Day Day had just went off to work. I think she got her a new job or something like that. Um, and she, so you know, Michael was like, "Oh, all right. Well, you know, she ain't here." So, and then the mom was like, "You know, well, what you got going on?" And he was like, "Well, shit. You know, I just stopped by to, to let you know that um, I'm going to see uh, Sarah tomorrow for uh, Baby Rain's birthday." And so, you know, I got to head out and go do that. But, you know, other than that, you know, I just been out here scratching and surviving. So, you know, the mama trying to figure out why he looking so stressed out. She was like, you know, well, what's going on with you? And he was just like, you know, it's really it's Maria. Like Maria has just really been the center of my stress. And, you know, he was pretty much hinting at the fact that they've been doing a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, and that, you know, Maria is just not where it's at. So the mama was like, well, you know, what was, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Like, you know, cause obviously y'all been doing this, y'all been fussing, y'all been fighting. So what makes it over this time? 
and he said that you know he just it clicked when he realized that she keeps putting him in these positions and to where he can go back to jail he said that his daughters are very important to him and that jail is just not where it's at. So at the end of the day, he j he doesn't want to go back to jail, but he really is also out here trying to do right for his daughters and trying to have more for his kids. And Maria is the type of woman that doesn't give a damn about any of that. You know what I'm saying? Maria could care less at the end of the day. So, um, he said he realized that, that, you know, that's just not the kind of relationship that he's trying to be in. And so the mama was like, okay, yeah, well, I understand that. I get that. And the whole time that he is explaining himself and why he broke up, um, at one point the phone rang. So he was like, oh, you know, that's Sarah. So then he just keeps talking about what's going on between his probation and um, the issues with Maria and the phone rings again. And so the mama was like, you know, was that Sarah again? And he said, yeah. And she's like, well, you know, why you don't want to answer it? So then he gets into this conversation about how, you know, Sarah just always want to be against him and don't want to let him be the father that he's trying to be and just this whole song and dance about how he's trying to be this great man and she's blocking it and the mama just like oh well you know i ain't never seen this side of you and she was definitely caping for michael and i'm just like i <laughs> you know i ain't gonna give you too much but what i will say to you mama michael is that yes as his mother, you are supposed to cape for him in, in a way. But at the same time, you have to also be strong enough. You have to also be that parent. That's going to be brutally honest with your children. You know what I'm saying? Especially considering that your child is a grown ass man. I get that you want to be all that you can be as a father. But put yourself in Sarah's shoes and realize all that this woman has had to do the whole time that you were locked up for bad decisions that you made. You know what I'm saying? This lady had to hold it down. So you can't just expect that everything that you want to do right then and right there, that Sarah is just supposed to be like, oh, okay, here, here you go. Here go your kids go on and do whatever you want to do with them. Like, no, you have to factor in all the bullshit that you've done in the past. You have to factor in all the dumb shit and the disrespectful shit that you have said and done to her in the past. This is not stuff that Sarah has just forgot and swept up under the rug. Like, no, this stuff is very much still sitting in the forefront of her mind. So when you call her, even if you ain't on no disrespectful stuff, even if you just nicely trying to say, okay, well, I would like to come and get my child and spend some time with my children. You know what I'm saying? That's all I want to do. If she says no, I'm not saying you have to be okay with the no, but you have to find a way to make some sort of compromise. It can't just be what you want and it can't just be what she want. Y'all gonna have to find some kind of way to meet in the middle. But is there going to be resistance in the beginning like it is right now? Yes. And so like Michael's mom, like I feel like you ought to have had that conversation with him. But for some reason, you strike me as the type that, you know, that's the kind of relationships that you were in. You've always been in the relationships where a man can just tell you whatever he want to tell you. He can do whatever he want to do to you. And you're just going to sit there quietly and take it. And I think that that has something to do with your past. I would be, you know, very interested to know how your childhood was and how you grew up because you strike me as a really passive sweep stuff under the rug kind of woman and that ain't the type of advice that michael needs michael needs somebody that's gonna get in his ass 
Michael needs somebody that's going to give his ass a reality check. And you're not that one to do it. So, yeah, caping for him and being proud of him for maturing and, you know, wanting to do what he needs to do as a father. Yeah, it's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, when he's in the wrong or, you know, when he just can't have his cake and eat it too, you need to be able to tell his ass that. And if he get mad, he just get mad. Scratch your ass and get glad. But anyway, y'all, that was Love After Lockup. Season 3, episode 10. Like I said, we got a couple more episodes of this cast from season 2. And then our original cast from season 3 will return. But, you know, we're just going to deal with these crazy ass people until then. So, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and log off. Because this is probably the latest that I've ever done a review. But, Love at the Lock Up came on Friday. And today is Sunday. So, this is probably the earliest I done ever got a review done. So, any damn way, y'all. Until next time, be happy, be healthy, be safe. This is your girl, P-Hope, and I will catch you in the next video.